I've got a list of eight random questions here. I roll the die three times and whatever I land on, that's where we start at least. If you could be on the game show of your choice, what show would you pick and could you actually win it? One that's pure chance. Like I want like the wheel of fortune level. I don't want to have to bring any expertise. I don't want trivia. I don't want any of that. I want luck. I want cold hard luck and I will have as much of a chance as anybody else in it winning. <laughs> Must haves. What is something that you can't be on set without? Whether it is your side, your notes, a certain snack, something to pass the time in between scenes, you name it. It's funny you should um, ask because I'm quite famous for carrying everything I own with me at all times. I don't know where it comes from. It must be some some sort of inherited behavior, but I, I carry like, just in case I'm gonna need my drink bottle, my thermos, um, my book, uh, I've got my script, my binder, got an iPad, and I like have it all under my arms at any given moment. And I'll move like 10 feet and I'll carry it just in case like I need it. It's just quite bizarre. It's gotta be some, sort of hoarding style technique. <laughs> this visual is making me feel better about myself because my friends are always picking on me because I'm always the person to go out with like everything in my hands or pockets. Yeah. Like, why can't yeah. I just get a bag? I have to make it more difficult on myself for some reason. Exactly, I've had families say it's like me carrying around all my teddy bears. It's the same sort of mentality. It's like, just in case I need all these mates, ready, ready to play. <laughs> Number three is never again. What is something that you did for a role that now looking back makes you say, I'm very glad I tried that, but never again. Dirt boarding. I had to dirt board, which not only is just like, it's like a mountain, like wheeled snowboarding is what I would compare it to. It's like these giant tired boards that you ride down a mountain and you literally stop by crashing into a tree. That's like the, that's sort of the, thing is like well you're gonna bail at the end of the thing so just try to bail as well as you can um but not only that dirt board was like the hardest word i've ever said in an american accent as well dirt board it was just a particularly like r forward and actually i had to say the line a dirt border's girlfriend and i was like Ugh. couldn't get my mouth around it so dirt boarding is is a never again for me i think in a movie or well, probably in real life <laughs> We are gonna build your very own Ghostfeld house. And the first thing we need to do is we need to have you pinpoint a location. What what type of, of home do you want and where in the world do you want it to be? Oh, you know, I've been out of New Zealand for a long time and I'm pretty homesick. So I'm gonna say Piha Beach is my favorite beach in New Zealand. It's like a big black sand, wild surf beach. It's very close to where I grow. Sounds like an excellent choice to me. So now you can have a, a ghost from the past living with you. Anyone you want, who do you pick and why? Ah, oh, maybe like, um, I like the idea of like a, a relative from like 10 generations ago. Really go back there. Us being here is evidence that something they did worked, that we survived, you know. Um, Maybe some sort of uh, inherited like wisdom from somebody 10 generations ago, that's what I'd take. This next one I'm calling the entertainment ghost because I feel like there's great value in having a ghost on hand who can just offer some good entertainment, no matter the form. But I guess I, I kind of have to get dark with this one. So you can lure a favorite performer to this home and you know do what needs to be done to turn him into a ghost. Who do you pick and why? Oh, oh, this is so tricky. Hang on, I'll take... I'll take um, T Murph, who I worked with on Woke, a show a couple of years ago. He's a comedian from Chicago, and he is just a joke machine. That guy is like just one liner after one liner after one liner. I feel like you could literally, I would want to be able to check out a little at this, you know, ghost house and just kind of watch and get like not have to um, engage too much. And I feel like you could turn him on like a television and just watch. So that's that's what I would do. Smart pick right there. This next one is the the ghost ghost. You can take one ghost from the show and have them live with you. Who do you pick? Oh, probably Richie because he's just so optimistic. He'd be able to find the silver lining in any cloud. I'd take that, yeah. You can invite a real life friend to come live there because they are the most likely person to believe you when you tell them that you could see ghosts. Who is that friend? That friend uh, would be Jennifer Morrison from Once Upon a Time. You know, the amount that we had to believe on that show, I remember her talking about having to really invest in the belief in this, the powers of like this coconut that she carried around as like a, um, like a handbag or something. The amount that she's had to suspend like reality and believe 
things in that show. Um, she's also like one of my best friends. So I think that would, she would, she would be kind of able to get on board and be earnest and commit to like, all right, this is happening. Um, she'd take me seriously, I think. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Collider Ladies Night. I am so excited to welcome Rose McIver to the show because her new series, Ghosts, is an utter delight, an absolute must watch. Rose, huge congratulations on Ghosts. Thank you so much. We're so grateful and excited that people seem to love it and enjoy it and Hopefully they get a good time watching it because we want to keep making it forever. <laughs> you kind of fell into acting and got that momentum going. But do you remember the first time that you realized you needed to act in terms of, you know, when a performance just felt so right that it became more of a more than a career goal, but rather, you know, a feeling, a creative feeling that you needed to keep having? Yeah, the, the standout for me, funnily, was Xena. When I was nine, I did an episode of Xena where... It was when Lucy Lawless was pregnant and um, she needed a light episode. So they wrote this episode where her soul gets put into the body of a little girl. I played Xena, but in the nine-year-old girl's body. And it was the first time where it was really taking something on. I remember Lucy generously like recorded all of these cassettes that I still have of her doing the war cry or um, her talking about you know, choices that she's made as the character and just was really generous. And that was the first time, yeah, it would have been nine where I got to do pretty extensive stunts. I got to do like a flip on a harness and um, I just found the like taking over something and um, really getting lost in, in somebody else and building a character. It wasn't just saying words. It wasn't, um, it, th there was kind of a lot of planning and I liked that that, you know, sort of structuring a character and coming up with ideas for it. It was really kind of eye-opening and I thought this is so deeply creative because I think I'd often thought of acting as you're channeling somebody else's creativity or bringing somebody else's words to the screen. You're doing um, kind of, you're a vehicle for somebody else's idea. And this was the first time I was like, oh, there's very significant creative input you can have as well. Let's go to Lovely Bones now. So that was the first thing that I ever saw you in. And I feel like it is kind of often classified as a breakout project for you. But I want to know, does, did it truly feel that way to you when that movie came out? It was the most surreal year of my life. I, oh, I was, yeah, 18 when I auditioned, I guess. I'd just finished high school and I auditioned, I went and... Um, with like greasy hair. I'd literally come from the gym or from a workout or something. And I think I just thought it was such a long shot. Put down this tape and kind of didn't overthink it and then assumed nothing was going to happen. And about two months later, got a kind of cold call out of nowhere saying, can you come down and meet Peter Jackson in Wellington tomorrow kind of thing. It was kind of a callback, but it was a read through. It was this sort of surreal experience. And I had planned to do what in New Zealand, we call your OE. It's like your overseas experience. And your first year out of high school, you often go and do like backpacking in Thailand or Europe or something. And, and I had booked this trip and we were camping through Eastern Europe, me and two girlfriends. And it still felt like enough of a long, like, even though I'd got this callback, I kind of was like, I don't want to miss this trip and, you know, say no to this. And then not then the job doesn't work out and I end up just with nothing to do. So I still went on the trip and I remember it was way pre cell phones that as we have them now and our plans that we have now, and it cost a fortune to call internationally. So I just had like a $20 top up card with like texts on it. And I got texted from my agent in New Zealand halfway through that trip telling me I'd booked it. And I was like camping in Bosnia or something at the time and didn't even get on the phone about it. It was just like, yes, it's come through. And we, I think we even negotiated via text. Like they came up with the deal and everything. And it was really weird. Um, but it was, I mean, it was completely life-changing for me. I went and filmed in Pennsylvania for three months and got to work with New Zealand royalty, Peter Jackson and Fran and Philippa. And we shot this this film that I'm, I'm proud of. I mean, it was a, I love the novel so much. I'm very uh, attached to those characters and that story. And it was, yeah, completely surreal and remarkable. And I mean, even just being in filming in American high schools, it's the stuff that I'd seen on television growing up so much and cafeterias and cheerleading teams. And it was just, um, I mean, the most fish out of water kind of experience that I've had, but it, 
it was it was wonderful and then I went home and life just kind of goes on you know the film didn't come out for another year after that and I remember people saying to me you should stay in LA now and this is and it just all felt so strange and um kind of whimsical and I didn't know whether there was I didn't really buy that it was going to go anywhere I, I, I don't know I didn't didn't want to count my chickens before they hatched. So I went back home and I went started at university and um, didn't have very much discipline at university and kind of stuck stuck around there a bit, um, worked in like retail for a year or two, the equivalent of like um, Forever 21 or whatever. I just got a job, just had a sort of weird year where I was first year out of high school, kind of learning how to be an adult. And then, then the film came out and then I sort of, started getting a few more opportunities and it's still, I mean, the move out to LA, I moved out to LA a year after that. It, it didn't, um, it wasn't like I swanned in and every door was open. I mean, I was so lucky that it did create definitely some opportunities, but I still got out here and, you know, I had to battle to find a flat and take weird music video jobs in the desert and, you know, just try to cobble something together and work out why I'd, why I'd left home. And um, it's kind of been, I, I never really am convinced that it's like all all sorted now. And now my career is going to be great. It's like I keep kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. I don't think anything's a given. And I think it's a nice way to feel. I feel really appreciative that um, everything that comes along still feels so exciting to me. Um, that I still kind of, I know I'm aware what a privilege it is to, to do this job. Um, and that it could go away because these things can. Um, it's nice. It's It's kind of really important to me bringing up the the process of you know making a pilot and then getting it picked up how, how did that how did maybe the i zombie experience and other shows that you've done compare to what ghosts was like well this last two years obviously has changed the whole rhythm of everything so it was very soon we did our read through our big table read we didn't even have we hadn't cast um jay's role my husband's role we did a read through on a friday and we were due to start shooting on the monday still missing three characters i think trying to worry about getting them cast over the weekend. And after the read through that afternoon was when national emergency was declared and everything shut down. And so everybody said at the time, oh, it'll be two weeks. And, um, and then we all know what happened. That can be kind of a long gestation process anyway, where it's like you make the pilot and then you wait and find out what's going to happen. But this was like read through in March, shot the pilot in December, got picked up the next March, started shooting the next July. It felt like by the time we got on set to shoot the first season, it felt like a sort of six year reunion or something. I don't know. Like everybody had been communicating so much. Everybody knew each other. It didn't it, in a way that I think really served the show um, because especially in a first season, you're normally building rapport still with your fellow actors and kind of finding your dynamics. And we had all, whether it was just on zoom or text or whatever, we kind of had really started to get a rhythm between us and we'd all, understood a little bit how we each work and um what's funny and what you know who e who we each kind of play as the pieces of this jigsaw puzzle so that was actually that was a weird very positive um element of it but yeah very very strange sort of drawn out experience to get to where we are and we're all just like it's surreal we're on a two-week hiatus right now about to shoot the um, final five episodes of the season and um yeah, I mean, just so happy people seem to resonate with it and you can spend two years building something up and then it could be a disaster and nobody kind of likes it or engages. So we're all pinching ourselves. It seems to be landing. <laughs> what about the production challenges of shooting a show like this? Because, you know, you got one character who can see the ghosts, someone else who does not. Does that mean you have to almost shoot everything twice in order to get both versions of uh, of what the room is looking like? Yes, we do. Um, we mainly cover it with everybody there. That's basically how we treat it. And then we do one pass because we shoot in Montreal. They say sans fantôme instead of uh, ghostless, but um, it's the sans fantôme pass, which is when they all get out and it's just Utkash and I. There's tricks with both sides of it. Like it's, it's trickier for me when everybody's gone and I'm still trying to remember whose eyelines to play to. But for him, he has to ignore them all of the time anyway. So, and he has to do that for longer stretches than I do. You know, his, his challenge is for the majority of the footage. Mine is just in a few of the, of the shots. So um, it is a technical show. It's a very technical show. Um, there's a, a big cast with, you know, lots of improvisers in there, people trying to work out how to find each other, how to find our moments, when to pipe up, when not. Um, 
and it's just getting stronger and stronger. I think like I'm in awe of some of the skills that I'm surrounded by every day. And I'm not from an improv background. That's something that I'm, I'm enjoying a lot, but it's not my, it's not what I was trained in. So being with these kind of pros who have just done that their whole lives, it's phenomenal to watch and um, lots to learn. Huge, huge, huge congratulations on Ghost and also everything that you've accomplished. But for right now, to anybody out there who has not done the Ghost binge, trust me when I tell you, it will be such a wonderful source of light in your life. You will love it. Please check it out. And again, Rose, congratulations on this and everything. And I hope to have you on Ladies Night again soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I hope to as well. 